Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the January 2024 meeting of the California Privacy Protection Agency Board. It's January 12th, 2024 at 10.09 a.m. Thanks to everyone for your patience while we manage the complexities of the hybrid meeting format. I'm Jennifer Urban. I'm the chairperson of the board, and I'm pleased to be here in person with the board members in Oakland and some members of the public and to welcome many of you via Zoom as well. Um, as ever, before we get started with the substance of the meeting, I have some logistical announcements. First, I'd like to ask everyone, this sounds very echoey to me. Is it is it all right on the, okay. If everybody in the room can take it, as long as it's picking up all right for the folks online. Sure. Yeah, it's still, it's quite far from, my mouth, but it's, uh, I feel like the voice of, you know, <laughs> a deity of some sort. <laughs> uh, Oscar may have the solution. Well, it's still a bit loud. I'm going to go ahead and continue, but please interrupt me if it gets too um, frustrating. Um, so ironically, first, I would like to check that everybody else have their microphone muted when they are not speaking. Um, second, I'd like to ask everyone who is here in person to turn off or silence your cell phone to avoid interruption. Um, thank you for doing that. And third, importantly, this meeting is being recorded. We, are, we do encourage everyone to wear masks if you're intend, attending in person. Um, we are in the midst of another COVID surge and we do want to avoid exposing vulnerable members of the community or inadvertently making our public meetings inaccessible to them. Um, as you know, our temporary ability to meet remotely and still comply with Bagley Keen has um, changed uh, quite a bit and is much more limited than it was. Um, therefore, this meeting is in a hybrid format my fellow board members and members of the CPPA staff are here in person, and I know most members of the public are joining remotely. Um, as you noticed already, um, the hybrid format creates some technical complexities. Um, so if we have any technical kinks, we'll ask that um, you please bear with us. We will pause the meeting and address the issue. Um, thank you in advance if anything happens um, for your patience. Uh, let me now go over the logistics of meeting participation. Today's meeting will be run according to the Bagley Keen Open Meeting Act as required by law. We will proceed through the agenda, which is available as a handout here in Oakland and also on our website. Materials for the meeting are also available as handouts here and on the website. Um, you may notice board members accessing their laptops, phones, or other devices during the meeting. They are using the devices solely to access materials for the board meeting. After each agenda item, there will be an opportunity for questions and discussion by board members. I will also ask for public comment on each agenda item. Each speaker for public comment will be limited to three minutes per agenda item. Um, we also, for the public, have a designated item on the agenda for general public comment. That's number six today. Um, if you are attending via Zoom and you wish to speak on an item, please wait until I call for public comment and allow staff to prepare for Zoom public comment then please use your raise the hand function, which is in the reaction feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you wish to speak on an item and you are joining by phone, please press star nine on the phone to show the moderator that you are raising your hand. Our moderator will call your name when it's your turn and request that you unmute yourself for comment at that time. Those using the webinar can use the unmute feature and those dialing in by phone can press star six to unmute. When your comment is completed, the moderator will mute you. Please note, for those of you joining remotely, that the board will only be able to hear you and not see you. So it is helpful if you identify yourself, but this is entirely voluntary, and you may input a pseudonym when you log into the meeting if you're using the webinar. If you're participating in person and wish to speak on an item, please wait for me to call for public comment and then move toward the podium um, or move toward, yes, move toward the podium to my right and form a line. Um, uh, uh, when you are called to speak, um, you will have three minutes um, at the podium. As with Zoom attendees, it's always helpful if you identify yourself, but again, this is entirely voluntary and you are free to remain anonymous or refer to yourself with a pseudonym. Please do speak into the microphone so everyone participating remotely can hear you and your remarks can be recorded in the meeting record. Um, the hybrid meeting uh, format, as I mentioned, is somewhat complex. 
Um, uh, and so I'd especially like to thank the team managing the technical aspects of the meeting today, Ms. Trina Hurtado and Mr. Oscar Estrella. Um, second, I would like to explain what to do if those attending remotely experience an issue with the remote meeting, for example, the audio dropping. If something happens, please email our info email address. That's info at cppa.ca.gov. That is I, India, N, November, F, Foxtrot, O, Oscar at cppa, our initials dot ca for California dot gov. This will be monitored throughout the meeting. If there is an issue that affects the remote meeting, we will pause the meeting to let our technical staff work on fixing the issue. Um, as a reminder, um, the board always welcomes public comment on the agenda, and it is our intent to ask for public comment before we vote on any agenda item. If for some reason I forget to ask for public comment and you wish to speak on that item, please raise your hand. The moderator will alert me and we will recognize you. Um, once again, each speaker will be limited to three minutes per agenda item. Relatedly, um, I'd like to remind everyone of some of the other rules of the road under Bagley Keene. Both board members and members of the public may discuss agendized items only. And if you're speaking on an agenda item, both board members and members of the public must contain their comments to that agenda item. There are two additional options under Bagley Keene, however. First, the public specifically can bring up additional topics when the board brings up that agenda item. That is number six today. Um, however, board members cannot respond. We can only listen. In addition, agenda items um, not on the items not on the agenda can be suggested for future board meetings when we take up the agenda item designated for that purpose, number seven today. We'll take breaks as needed, including for lunch and shorter breaks as needed. I'll announce each break and when we plan to return approximately so that members of the public can leave and come back if they wish to do so. Please note that agenda item number eight today is a closed session item. The board will leave the room for the closed session and return after it's completed its closed session discussion. During the closed session um, time, the Zoom session will remain open and members of the public can come and go as you like. My thanks to all my fellow board members for their service and everyone working to make the meeting possible. Um, I would like to thank um, all the conference experts who helped out in addition to our technical staff, Mr. Phil Laird, who's asking at, acting as our meeting counsel today, Mr. Ashkan Sultani here in our executive uh, capacity as executive director, and our moderator, Mr. Kevin Sabo, um, who I'd like to thank and welcome and ask him to please go ahead and conduct the roll call. Yes, the roll call for attendance, board member Dale Present. Present, board member Lay. Present. Lay present, board member McTaggart. Present. McTaggart present, board member Worth. Present. Worth present, Chair Urban. Present. Urban present. Madam Chair, you have five presents and no no or no absences. Thank you very much, Mr. Sapa. The board has established a quorum. Um, as usual, I would like to let board members know we'll take a roll call vote on any action items. Um, with that, we'll move to agenda item number two, which is an update from our executive director, Mr. Ashkan Sultani. Thank you so much, Mr. Sultani, for briefing us today. Whenever you're ready, please go ahead. That's for two. Great. Um, thank you, Chair Erwin and members of the board. I'm pleased to present the uh, our annual update from the AED. Um, first, I'll provide you with a few updates since our last meeting, and then I'll give a quick look ahead uh, at some highlights as we kick off the year. So um, starting with the agencies, 20, 2023 was a big year for us. I'm pleased to share that since our last hiring update to the board in September, we've added seven new full-time employees and one student intern across the various divisions. In addition, three of our team members have received promotions within the agency. Since we're a small agency and new, these hires are essential to meeting our mission, and I'd like to thank the admin team for their incredible effort in helping us grow. I'm also proud to share that our agency participated in Cal HR's superior Accomplishments Awards program for the first time last year. This program recognizes state employees who have made an exceptional co contribution to the state and nominees must be given, uh, must be, have worked at the agency for at least a year. I'm thrilled to share that we had five employees recognized for their service. Um, a few names we're familiar with you, uh, Kristen Anderson, um, Neil for Sheikh, Maureen Mahoney, in addition, Julie Hall on our enforcement team, who also handles um, our complaints, 
and Koiseli, who's on our admin team. Um, they were all recognized. Next, I'll move on to the data broker registry. Um, speaking of an outstanding achievement, I'm pleased to announce that the data broker registry is up and running. As you know, Senate Bill 362 transferred the data broker registry from the Department of Justice to our agency. The Department of Justice had an existing IT portal in place for operating the registry and collecting payments, but unexpectedly, they were unwilling to maintain the system even temporarily to receive registration payments for Jan 1 to Jan 31st, uh, which is the current registration window. As a result, we scrambled to implement a basic registration system using our very limited IT resources. This effort was truly a testament to the dedication and flexibility of our staff, particularly our admin, our admin team and Elizabeth Allen, who was recently promoted to our legal de department and is uh, handling a lot of the um, day to day on the data broker registry. In accordance with the law, we launched the registry on Jan 1 and will continue to maintain the portal until the end of the month. We've received a good number of registrations and, in our, and are actively monitoring overall compliance as compared to past years and with other states. We will then publish a list of paid registrants on our website after the payments are processed, likely in March, and we will continue to um, implement the registry in future years. Next, on to rulemaking. As you know, SB 362 also uh, required us to set fees and regulation, which the board approved last meeting. We successfully completed the necessary rulemaking for the data broker registry fee, and the approval documents are in the process of being uploaded to our website. In addition, staff are diligently working on preparing materials for the agency's next rulemaking package on cybersecurity risks, sorry, cybersecurity risk assessments, ADMT, as well as uh, updates to the existing CCPA regulations. This process includes receiving individual input from board members on ADMT and risk assessments that were proposed in our December meeting. I believe we've now received feedback from nearly all the board members and we're in the process of incorporating that feedback in, to present to the board at our next meeting. In addition, we're also undertaking the economic analysis necessary to support that rulemaking, although we ultimately need to follow, finalize the proposed text before we can uh, complete that work. Next, on to enforcement. Our enforcement division has been very active. You'll recall that the enforcement division had Mike Macko announced an inquiry into the connected vehicles, into connected vehicles in July. Uh, the same month that we received our enforcement authority. We have many investigations underway, not just in connected vehicles, but many other general areas that uh, Mr. Macko proposed to the board. Um, we will be addressing enforcement in more detail at our annual update in the spring, but for now, I wanted to point out the enforcement division has grown by 400% in the last three months, and we plan to grow even more in the near future. The division's next hire will be the assistant chief counsel for enforcement, and that recruitment's underway, um, along with additional attorney recruitments. Please share those with your networks if you have suggestions or, or, or um, folks you think might be interested. Recruiting is very difficult in this area, as you know. Um, in the meantime, the division is active. The enforcement division is actively pursuing investigations and regularly reviewing consumer complaints, which have also been a useful way uh, for us to understand what consumers are experiencing in the marketplace. Um, next, on to business guidance. Um, our CPPA website, on our on the CPPA website, you'll now find a resources page which includes information for businesses. Um, currently on that page, we have, we have uh, guidance on four topics. Um, one on which businesses need to comply with the CCPA. Um, another on information about opt-out notices or about notices in general, I'm sorry. Um, another on information on opt-out preference signals and how businesses have to respond to those. And then another helpful resource on personal information and those definitions. All of this guidance is informational and not legal advice. Primarily, these pull together different portions of our logs and regulations into a concise reference on these topics. Um, as appropriate, we'll, we'll continue to provide these guidances on additional topics, but we think that's a good start for, uh, for our agency. In addition to the business guidance, we've also added a table of motions to our website which is a summary of all the past action the board have taken and voted on. Like the meeting transcripts, this chart will hopefully serve as a reference for past board activity for the board and the public. Now, looking ahead, January 21st to 27th is Data Privacy Week. And 
leading up to Data Privacy Day on Sunday, January 28th. We are once again partnering with Senator Dodd, Senator Dodd's office on outreach efforts, and we'll also take an, uh, another social media campaign informing the general public on what they can do to keep their information safe. I'm also proud to, to share that in conjunction with Data Privacy Week, we're launching a brand new privacy information resource for the state, a new privacy website at privacy.ca.gov. In, our, in alignment with our mission to promote public awareness and understanding of privacy, we've created an entirely new website, which sits separately, which sits separate from the agency's website to provide information and resources related to privacy to the public. While our agency is responsible for the website, we think it's important to use this as a resource for privacy protections across the state, including links to other laws, privacy laws, agencies, and complaint systems. This launch is just a start. We plan to add more information and resources as part of our larger public awareness effort and, and education campaign this year. And just a note, our website, cppa.ca.gov, isn't going away. That will still host the information as it has now, including regulations, board meeting information, and additional guidance. Our public affairs division will update you on important outreach efforts and do a deeper dive on this website uh, as part of our regular updates. And then a side note, as part of launching this website, we had an opportunity to work with the state center for, uh, uh, sorry, uh, CDT, um, State uh, Department of Technology, to configure analytics in a more privacy preserving way for the state. And what that will do is raise not just uh, protections on our website, but hopefully uh, protections for consumers accessing any website on the, of the California state government. So that was a nice little side bonus. And so with that, that concludes my update. I'm pretty excited how far we've come just in the last year, both in terms of size, as well as various efforts on public awareness, enforcement, complaints. Um, I'm happy to take any questions or address any, um, any uh, ambiguities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Soltani. Um, it's pretty exciting that five out of our small staff got statewide awards. That has to be a, a really, um, impressive proportion of, of, of our staff to, to receive these statewide awards. Um, and this is all really exciting. Um, I will be looking up and down to see if anybody has questions or comments. Um, I wanted, oh yes, Mr. McTaggart, please. Hi, hi there, I was just wondering, um, do you happen to have any uh, data on the consumer complaints? Like, are there 10, are there, you know, 100? <laughs> like what, what sort of numbers and, uh, what are we typically getting back to them just sort of saying thank you or, you know, and then do we ever close a case and say, sorry, we looked into it. We don't, we don't think you have a complaint or what's, what's, the, what's the process there? Happy to get into that at a high level. So um, certainly it's more than 10. It's uh, about 10 times that. Um, we actively have, and Mr. Macko will provide some details in his regular uh, enforcement update, including on the complaint system. We have a flow for both sworn and unsworn complaints where we typically respond to each complaint that comes into our system. Some of those will be um, kind of just uh, referrals to other agencies or, or responses that um, the complaints are not within our purview. For the ones that we that are under our purview, particularly sworn complaints in our purview, we, will re we typically respond uh, with um, any action or non-action that we've taken on that matter, as well as refer it for ongoing monitoring or enforcement. And in fact, a number of the, the enforcement matters that I referenced were the result of complaints. Thank you. Other questions or comments? I'm excited to hear about the privacy.ca.gov um, website. Um, I confess I'm a little, I'm having a little bit of trouble visualizing how it connects to our existing web materials. And I'm assuming there'll be a link from our website to privacy.gov gov and then other state agencies might link to it and might also put content on it did i understand you correctly we um certainly will link to it from our website and certainly we have linked to other agencies and included content from other agencies previously the department of justice had additional information mm -hmm. on what other kind of agencies yes. handle privacy um, we do hope to engage our kind of inter through our intergovernmental affairs um, additional kind of opportunities for people to um, add information about their laws. Um, as you know, there's also a lot of collaboration that we undertake mm -hmm. with um, either joint enforcement or referrals. And so we wanted 
Um, we saw, it, and this is um, probably to Mr. Mishpagadar's question as well, um, we saw in, in our complaint system a lot of confusion as to, for example, what our agency's purview are, what, right. um, you know, when people have concerns about government surveillance, for example, that's not necessarily our purview. And so this helps us um, both achieve our mission as well as refer people to the important resources that they need in, a, in, in an event that we can't help them or we can't service them. Um, but in, in terms of your question as to the difference, you know, I see our um, cbpa.ca.gov website really being for the board and for the agencies kind of more um, uh, kind of uh, government facing mm -hmm. uh, activities. And I see kind of the privacy portal as being really a consumer resource to help inform Californians when they think privacy. And we have a couple of these in the state. We have cannabis, we have a portion, we have other kind of theme oriented sites. And so we were really um, encouraged to be able to, this was not an easy process. I'll just say we were really encouraged to be able to get this resource and really help um, use this resource to promote privacy across the state. As, as you know, that's one of the three pillars of our mission. Wonderful, thank you so much. Yes, Ms. De La Torre. Thank you. Um, we talked about the consumer side. Oh, maybe a little closer. Can you hear me now? Yeah, thank you. Uh, we talked a little bit about the consumer side. You also mentioned guidance provided to uh, the regulated community and some developments in terms of the information that has been posted on our side. Um, it, are there any plans to develop further guidance? Can you give us details on that? As you well know, it's very typical of privacy agencies to develop robust um, guidance for the regulated community, ideally before um, enforcement so that we can ensure that they have a chance to get the compliance um, before you know, there's a need for enforcement. Uh, thank you. That's a, that's a great question. Indeed, we do have uh, the business guidance uh, and business resources on this website and we'll continue to update that. Um, one thing that informs a lot of what business guidance we uh, provide is also questions to our uh, info box. We have a few frequently asked questions and we essentially, when we see certain topics that seem to cause confusion or people have questions about, we do provide additional kind of um, this this business guidance. As you know, we are limited in effectively what we can say beyond our rulemaking, but the business guidance takes into um, kind of takes what we have said in our rulemaking or in, in, in our uh, regulations, uh, in our laws and provides a kind of a concise resource um, and then lastly, I don't want to get ahead of um, our enforcement division, but I do expect we'll be providing additional compliance um, uh, compliance direction to the regulated community as well. I'll, I'll let um, Mr. Macko speak to that uh, at the appropriate time. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Lee. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Sultani, for the update. Um, yeah, you know, no questions. I think uh, I just wanted to appreciate, you know, all the progress that we made on a lot of different things um, since our last update. You know, the the website, I know probably building that data broker, taking that data broker registry over, um, you know, last minute probably was a, a huge lift and, um, you know, a, a good call out for them need to grow our own, you know, IT expertise in the agency. Um, so yeah, uh, big congratulations on being able to build that, you know, on, on short notice. Um, and you know the growth of enforcement, four hundred percent. I think a lot of folks are um, <clears throat> eager to see you know the enforcement, uh, the progress of the enforcement division. So you know we'll be listening to Mr. Mako's um, presentation with with bated breath. Um, and you know again the the partnership with the legislature, um, Senator Dodd, uh, on 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 this data privacy awareness. Um, so yeah, good good work. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I see seeing no additional hands from board members. I will simply add my congratulations and gratitude for some incredible developments and um, uh, successes um, over the past year and since your last update. Are there any comments from the public? Mr. Sabu? Yes, we have one hand raised. Masar at Alum, we're going to unmute you and you're gonna have three minutes to speak. Go ahead and unmute yourself using star six. So you've been unmuted. You can go ahead. You have three minutes. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Hi, I just tuned in, but I, the speaker mentioned the website privacy.ca.gov. 
um, and I just went to it, and all I get is a a weird site that requires me to log in, and with a with a warning about unauthorized access. So um, I'm not sure what's going on there. I just thought I'd mention that. Thank you so much. So it's launching on Privacy Week. Is that right, Mr. That Sultani? Correct. That is correct. Maybe it's say that again so everybody understands because that uh, it makes sense to be confused. Yeah, sorry. Uh, it's currently password protected. It's in kind of where we're finalizing um, some of the content and it will launch as part of Data Privacy Week, which is uh, next week. Do you have a date by which it will I, I be launched? I believe we're going to launch that on the 17th. Is that right? So January 17th, the public yes. can go to privacy.ca.gov and be able to see the resources you described. Indeed. And, and if you follow us on social media, on Twitter uh, or on LinkedIn, we'll have uh, announcements uh, to that effect as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you very much to the speaker for flagging that for us. Um, is there further pu public comment, Mr. Saba? Yes. Next, we have Edwin and Glenda. I will unmute you now, and then you can go ahead and speak. You have three minutes to make your comment. Uh, good morning. My name is Edwin Lombard. Um, good morning, members of the CPA, CPPA. As we enter 2024, we would like to take this opportunity to respectfully urge CPPA to honor the need for a 2024 transparent regulatory process on the following items. First, CPPA regulatory timeline. It is well talked about that this is the year of AI as everyone from government, business, and individuals anticipate addressing these issues. The small businesses I work with are eager to be a part of this process. So I, uh, so we asked today, when will CPPA share its regulatory AI timeline with us? Can we, can any of you please provide an answer to this question today? Second, working with small businesses, will CPPA take the time to address that our resources are limited and that CPPA overregulation could cripple or end the existence of many small businesses. From retail theft, inflation, and excessive CPPA regulation, small businesses simply cannot survive. There is no doubt that all of you and staff are qualified to handle the AI regulations, but with respect, it is doubtful that anyone at CPPA has operated a small business or has experienced what we need to stay open. We urge an empathetic and responsible 2024 regulatory pro approach. Let me close with this. To be clear, we are not saying do not do anything. We expect CPPA to do something, but it will be helpful to have a balanced approach so that small businesses can continue to be part of the California economy. Thank you, and we look forward to working with you in 2024. Thank you very much, Mr. Lombard. Um, Mr. Sabo, is there further public comment? Yes, Julian, I have unmuted you. You can go ahead and begin your three minutes when you're ready. Julian Cagnette, I've unmuted you. You can go ahead and speak whenever you're ready. Julian Cagnette, you've been unmuted. You can go ahead and speak whenever you're ready. I see your hand raised. Madam Chair, I don't see any other hands other than Julian Cagnette's. All right. Well, if Mr. Cagnette's hand goes up again, um, maybe we can circle back um, uh, in case he had a mic issue or something. Uh, thanks very much to members of the public who did comment, the board members, and especially to Mr. Sultani for that exciting update. We'll now move to agenda item number three, which is an update on budget and priorities for spring 2024. As a reminder, this is part of our regularized annual annualized, excuse me, our regular annualized calendar um, and is our um, opportunity for an update after the publication of the governor's budget, which I think was a couple of days ago. So please turn to those materials um, uh, for this agenda item in your packet for today. This item will be presented by our Deputy Director of Administration, Vaughn Chidambira. Thank you so much, Deputy Director Chidambira, for being with us today. Um, could you please let us know when you're going to advance the slide since we are facing the opposite direction um, so we can follow along? And please go ahead.
Good morning, and thank you, Chairperson Urban, board members. For this item, I'll be presenting the budget update and planning as well as priorities. Advance to the next slide. So the agenda shows that I'll be starting by looking back at fiscal year 2022-23, which is this past year. Then we'll get into our current year expenditures and the proposed budget for 24-25 and priorities. Next slide. And starting with 22-23, prior year budget and expenditures. Next slide. Our budget for 22-23 was 10,852,000 as reflected on the bottom line of the slide. And this amount is comprised of the $10 million appropriation per statute, is that okay? Okay. In addition to the 10 million, we had 616,000 from fiscal year 21, 2021, um, the initial appropriation for the agency that was um, a non-budget item. So we're able to bring this forward. An additional 236,000 in baseline adjustments and baseline adjustments are employee compensation and benefits. And this is what brought us to the 10.8 million. Next, I will discuss the budget summary. Next slide. So with that 10.8 million, this is how we planned to spend those dollars in fiscal year 22-23. This is the first year that we received our 34 authorized positions for the agency. And as part of that um, funding for the 34 positions, we expected to spend 39% towards salaries, 23% in benefits, general expenses at 10%. And these general expenses are typically um, resources needed for staff to continue with their um, duties. That includes um, resources for supporting our legal team, providing Form 700, equipment, IT, everything was included in that. We also had contracts, internal and external contracts, and media and outreach at 7%. And that is how we plan to spend the 10.8 million. I will move on to how those funds were actually spent. The budget summary, expenditure summary. At the end of 22-23, our actual expenditures were spent as follows. 20% was spent towards the salaries and 9% towards benefits. General expenses landed at 2%, interdepartmental contracts at 10%. Again, these for interdepartmental contracts, these are contracts with our agencies that have been supporting us with admin functions, including IT, HR, um, as well as procurement. External contracts were at 2% and media and outreach was at 57%. We had some contracting delays for media and outreach. And so that will continue. You'll see that in the next slide as well. And um, contracting for media and outreach was necessary with the cost savings as this is part of the mission for the agency, the three prong of education and outreach. It made sense to have a three year contract set aside to fund that mission. In future years, we can expect contracting costs to go down as we will be able to build capacity in-house. Next slide. Now moving on to the current year, 23-24. In 23-24, our budget was um, 12,625,000. To arrive to this amount, we had our starting appropriation of 11,458,000. Now our starting appropriation is no longer the 10 million because we now have the COLA included in that. Available from 2021, which was brought forward was 318,000. We had a one-time cost of living true up of $602,000. And this is from the fiscal year 2020, 2020, um, 2020 to 21 and 21 to 22. We had baseline adjustments for 247,000. And because the media and outreach contract was not finalized in the prior year, you see those dollars showing up again this year because this is when the, we're able to, this is when we're able to finally um, execute the contract. Moving on to the next slide. The 
the budget summary for 2023-24. At this point, we now have 48 positions in the agency. And so we expect more funding to go towards um, our salaries and benefits. And then we have contracting again at 11% for the interdepartmental contracts and external contracts only at 9%, general expense at 4%. And general expense has remained low because we're continuing to focus on a hybrid work environment, which is resulting in cost savings. Next slide. 23-24 um, year-to-date expenditures. At this point, when we were pre preparing the financial information for the board meeting, we, were, we had financial information up to November of 2023, which is only five months into the fiscal year. And so at that point, only 33% of our budget had been used. Of that 33%, 29% of the available funds. So the 33% is about 4.1 million from the 12 million that we have available. But from that 4 million, 29% um, has been spent on salaries and 14% on benefits. So again, personal costs continue to be the highest expense. Um, contracting costs are 22% and 28%. And then general expense appears to be at 7%. We expect salaries to continue to grow and take more of that um, space on the pie. And so the contracting costs will be decreasing as the salaries continue to grow and the benefits. Next slide. For fiscal year 24-25, this is our proposed budget. Our beginning appropriation is 11.4 million. Our cost of living adjustments is 777,000. Baseline adjustments are at 263, and our total budget that we're proposing is 11,898,000. Uh Next slide. So the governor's budget was presented um, on Ju January 10. Included in that budget was our caller adjustment for 3.6% and budget bill language for the caller adjustment. The advantage in having our caller budget bill in the budget bill language is that it will streamline the process for us to receive our caller adjustment. Prior to the budget bill language being included, we had to prepare a BCP, and that was a more cumbersome process for the caller adjustment, and now it'll be more streamlined. However, we'll still have to submit a BCP for any new positions that we need. With our caller adjustment for this year, we are requesting a graduate legal assistant, and this position will be assisting in the legal division with um, the lower level work that is coming in. And moving on to the next slide. For future BCP considerations, um, they include SB 362, a grant program and administrative staff. The data broker registry was transferred to the agency January 1, 2024 from the DOJ. And the DOJ had a remaining budget of about 180,000 in the current fiscal year. Since DOJ is no longer responsible for um, the data broker registry, those funds will be transferred to the agency. And so they are currently temporarily funding an attorney position that is working on that um, SB 362. This position was administratively established, which means it is a temporary position. The funding will end in January, in June 30, 2024. And so because the funding will end, we'll need to submit a BCP to secure permanent funding for SB 362 positions. Um, in addition to that, the agency is required to have a grant program per statute, and the agency is currently assessing resources to set up and run the grant program. It is possible that a BCP may be required to secure positions for that grant program. Um, from the time the agency was created, it was always the intent to bring in administrative services in-house. However, they are currently contracted out. And so as the agency grows, the focus is now on um, bringing in administrative resources in-house for us to have more streamlined operations. We are currently in the process of um, hiring a retired annuitant to help us assess our needs for human resources. 
And once that assessment is done, we'll be able to build um, HR in-house. We also plan to bring in contracting services. Procurement has been um, a struggle for us. And so hopefully bringing in contracting in-house will also help streamline our contracts. And we're also in the process of assessing the need for IT services and transferring them from Department of Consumer Affairs. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, Ms. Chikambira. Um, questions or comments from board members? Uh, yeah, Mr. Worth and Ms. De La Torre? Mr. Lay? And okay, let's go down the row. Mr. Worth, please go ahead. Thank you for that presentation. Um, you, you don't have to answer all this now, but if, I don't know if it's easy for you to go back, but I'm trying to follow the page number. Some are numbered, some weren't, but I think I have them. So page two, I just would love to see the headcount um, for the past years and the proposed, just to try to track the budget for the staff. You mentioned the baseline budget adjustments. It's you know it's a different number each uh, year, but you said it's related to employee compensation. What what exactly does that mean? Because I figured the main budget obviously covers employee compensation. So what is the baseline adjustment do, and what's that? What's has that? What's that process? I guess. So the benefits do change each year. And so gotcha. when Charlie Char does the increase, maybe 3%, then we have to calculate how much that will be based on the positions that we have as an agency. That information is sent to Department of Finance and they provide funding for that change. So that's that's above and beyond the cost of living adjustment. It is tied to that. It is, the basic yes, adjustment is. But okay. not the CPI, which is our caller right. adjustment, yes. Right, right, right. Um, I was curious on page six, which was the pie chart for the 22, 23 expenditures. I thought the media buy got pushed forward, but it shows being spent that year. You brought it back into the following year, the 6 million, right? Yes. So to, ex to explain that, um, so the 6 million in 22, 23 is when we had cost savings because we didn't have as many employees hired at the time. Right. Um, and so... From with that funding, that six million, it shows in the next fiscal year, 23-24. But it's it's actually tied to the 22-23 budget. So it was re We kind of booked it in 22, but spent it in 23-24. Yes. So okay. we encumber and, and we'll continue to spend it in future years. So we and we're encumbering a portion of that each year. Right. But it is tied to 22-23 budget. How many years will that cover us for the for the media portion of the budget? Like when does that come back and we have to have an, an outlay again like that? We expect to spend that funding in, by June, 2024. Oh. So it is tied for three years. And we should expect that kind of number again? To... No, we do not expect that kind of number in the future. Okay. So we needed to have that at the beginning because we didn't have a team in our public affairs team, but now we do have employees and we are hiring more. So that funding has been tied to the media buys but that more work to do with media, with outreach and public affairs will be done in-house. And we don't expect to have that much spending. Okay. And listen, I think this next one, page 11, I think it's a hard question because there's so much change and so much added responsibility, right? Um, that the agency's taken on. But I just looked from 22, 23 to 24, 25, the budget's up about a million dollars which is about 9%, so 4.5% per year. Do you think that's kind of, does that feel normal or is that because, is that unusual because of all the changes and the growth and there, is this too hard to try to extrapolate those, those increases going forward because of all the change and the growth and the new responsibilities or is that kind of representative? I'm just trying to get a sense long-term. Long-term, it's a little tricky to assess. However, um, from where we started, the changes have been tied to the cost of living adjustment. So the CPI, Consumer Price Index. Right. So with the 10 million, at each time we are adjusting for CPI. So if it's lower in the future years, we can expect less funding. Right. However, if there's a need within the agency, suppose we're able to justify a need for additional enforcement resources. If we're able to justify that and um, indicate to... Um, through the governor's budget that there's a need for this, we'll be able to get more funding outside of the CPI. Right. Which so I it's possible it, we can continue to grow. I would think we are going to continue to grow. Okay. Um, on 13, SB 362 is creating new positions, whether now or later, but just how many 
positions are we having to add to take on that responsibility? I was just curious. We're still evaluating, okay. but we understand that there's a need for at least an attorney. We have we, need, we have a need for IT resources as well as for um, regular administrative staff. So at minimum, maybe three. Oh, that's it. Okay. But we are evaluating the okay. needs. And then on the IT and, and human resources, the idea of bringing those in-house, would we get a chance to look at the cost benefit of those? We have. Once you, you already have or? Um, we are, so that we, we, we understand there's a need for sure because of some of the difficulties we've had working with other agencies Understand because we're that. outside. We're right. always sometimes not always a priority. Right. Um, I, I would want to say that it is important for us to have these in-house, okay. but for HR purposes, we are bringing in someone in-house to do this assessment for us. Does it make sense for us to bring this in-house? And if it does, how much are we going to save? Because right now we have dedicated resources with DGS. Um, it has been helpful, but we think that it could be better if we had it in-house. And so this resource that we, we bring, we're bringing in, a retired annuitant with the state, can help us better assess that. And we'll be able to make it a better determination. What about IT? Would you do the same thing? The same is true for IT. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. I think um, Executive Director Soltani can speak more to IT. Kind of these proposals to the board at the time when we make the request from Department of Finance as part of the BCP process. So as we've done that analysis and make a recommendation, we'll make a recommendation to the board that this is what we'd like to do. And then that will be part of the regular budget process when, right. we, when we do both this time of year, uh, as well as uh, after July when we start doing planning. I, I think it's helpful because I was only thinking just in the math of it all, but you just brought up the, the point that I wouldn't be privy to. Explain when you do that, the troubles you've had, right? Because it's not a cost benefit only. Right. Right. Thanks. That, that's all I had. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ms. De La Torre. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I have um, two questions. The first one is my understanding is that we're facing um, a situation in the budget overall in the state of California that is leading to cuts. I also am aware of the fact that we have certain protections because of the fact that our uh, statute guarantees funding. Um, but I was wondering if you could speak as to how that situation can affect us this year and in the near future. As my understanding is that that um, shortfall is not is not going to change in the near future. Hopefully, it will eventually change. But I think that we're facing two, three, four years where, where that might be the case um, constantly. Sure. We do have um, the $10 million appropriate appropriated per statute. So we'll continue to receive that. However, in response to the expenditure freeze, um, the team, the leadership team has worked with um, the executive team to communicate the need for us to be prudent in everything that we're purchasing. And we have a process in-house where we need to justify why we need something before it is procured. And part of that process is ensuring that whatever we're purchasing is mission critical, aligned with the mission of the agency and our goals. And if it is necessary, we, ha we have to continue to procure what we need as a growing agency. We have to ma maintain operations. And so we're being mindful in our spending, understanding that we do have this appropriation per statute. So we do have funding available to us, but also being good stewards, continuing to be mindful of our spending. Thank you so much for that answer. And my second question is around the reference to the grant program. I think that's that's the last slide. Could you elaborate on, on what that grant program is and what it covers? It might be that the information was provided to the board, but it's not fresh in my mind. What's the grant program? Um, I, I do want to build this question over to Phil, our general counsel. He is well more, much more informed about what the grant program is exactly and how it's supposed to operate. I do understand the resources necessary from an admin perspective, but I'll let him speak from a legal perspective. Uh, good morning, board members. Um, yes, so uh, actually in the, in our law, there is a provision that was added about a grant program that exists um, uh, based on funding that will come in through penalties and fines assessed by DOJ and by our agency. Um, as that pool grows, um, the law basically provides that 9% annually of, of the total funds that come into the Consumer Privacy Fund go to a grant program. There's three components of the grant program. 
um, one uh, that would support uh, non, uh, go to nonprofits that are trying to promote privacy in California. Um, the second one is to nonprofits and um, governmental entities that are promoting um, uh, privacy awareness for youth. And so, you know, contemplate it could be even, you know, school boards or, or things of that nature that could apply for that grant. And the third component is a um, grant for law enforcement entities in California to partner with international authorities on um, data breach investigations. So um, this is a grant program that, again, is built in the statute and is one of our sort of core functions, directions to the agency to, to implement and administer. Um, but to date, the Consumer Privacy Fund uh, historically didn't have anything in it. But as we start to see enforcement from both the Attorney General's office and our agency underway, uh, those funds will be coming in and then it'll be uh, incumbent on the agency to administer those programs annually. Um, I have a couple of follow-up questions. I was aware of the provision on the statute, but I, I really appreciate you linking it to this. Um, the fund is going to receive um, revenue based on enforcement. Both the enforcement of the AG and the enforcement by the agency will kind of feed into that fund. Is that a correct assumption? That's correct. But the agency will make the determination on where the grants go. The, the agency solely administers the grant program. Okay, yes, absolutely. got it. Um, in terms of um, the vision for that, and I understand that that's still you know being worked out, what will be the expectation from the board perspective? Are those decisions going to be made aware? Um, is there gonna be options and we will get to kind of approve the final? How is it going to look like from the board perspective? Yeah, great, great questions. And, you know, I should, we, we won't get too far afield of the budget necessarily right now, but I can preview. Uh, we're thinking a lot about those processes. Um, uh, actually, I can say Ms. Garcia and I come from an agency that did quite a bit of grant administration in our previously roles. So we're familiar with the op options here. Um, but at its core, we will need to define uh, either through regulations or statutory amendments, um, further details and sort of mechanics of these grant programs. Um, so those are things that the board will likely have an opportunity to weigh in on. Um, and then those mechanics could go a number of ways. As you know, the board could sort of delegate a final decision-making um, process to staff. At the same time, we could engage in a process where staff proposes certain grantee awards and the board approves them. So there's a number of opportunities, but this is a program as we think through and develop, we will bring a proposal to the board to kind of, uh, really to sort of approve sort of the structure of that grant program. But as it stands, it's pretty wide open, which is uh, in my mind, a good thing because it allows us to build a really dynamic grant program that'll be most effective for this space. Thank you for your answers. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Um, yeah. Mr. Worthy actually asked my main question, which was around the, the transition to in-house. But I guess just to set expectations, I was seeing it more as you said streamlining is, is you get more priority, you get more control, but not necessarily cost savings. Um, is that is that the right way to expect this or is there gonna be expected cost savings from moving things in-house? Um, it depends. So with some of the functions, we could have cost savings. I expect that procurement we could use a smaller team and we might have cost savings there. Hmm. With HR, it's hard to say. And I think with IT, we could potentially have cost savings as well, depending on how, um, which way we choose, depending on the results of those assessments on our needs. Okay. I don't know if you want to speak to that. Thanks. Mr. McTaggart. Thank you. Um, just a quick question. And I, you, you may have said it, I may have just missed it, but for the SB 362 positions, those requests would be in addition to our guaranteed funding. It's not asking to spend our funding. Okay. <clears throat> That's correct. And then uh, the only other thing is, could we at some point get a report on the, I wasn't aware that we were had spent as much of the 6 million uh, for, the, for the outreach as possible. I mean, as, as we have, and it's gonna be spent by next June. I'd love to just see a report about where it went, how much went on radio, TV, do we do we measure any effectiveness? Did we you know do anything like that? And maybe if I've already seen when it's come, I apologize then. 
yeah, I, can, I can speak to that. The Public Affairs Division will be providing uh, an update as part of the annual calendar on the public affairs efforts, will, which include, uh, and we've done in the past when we um, did our past public awareness in 2022, I believe, that um, there was a subcommittee that Mr. Lay and Mr. Um, Thompson were on. We presented kind of what what outreach we did, radio, what the ROI was, what kind of engagement we got. And so we'll, so we'll, we'll do that. Um, I just want to also clarify that the um, we essentially have two public affairs um, contracts underway. One was for the media buy, and that's the one that will conclude at the end of this year. And then the six million ongoing is for kind of both media and production, uh, and, and and that will be a separate kind of um, related. They're basically two components. One is for the kind of the um, the buy side, and the other is for the production side. And so those two pots will be used in conjunction. But we will report back out um, to the board. Uh, and my understanding is that second pot, that six million, can go beyond 2024. Actually, it can go. The I second think, one, yes. Yeah, yes, the, that, that can actually go beyond. I think that ends 20, 2025 with an option to 2026, right? So, so the, that's that six million can extend us to 2026 for media production development, including outreach and including some stakeholder engagement. The prior encumbrance from uh, fiscal year 2021, 22, that ends at the end of this fiscal year. And that that will be part of the public affairs presentation that um, Miss uh, Miss White will present, uh, I think, in the spring. Okay, thanks. It would be great just to get a sense of both contracts and how much we're spending on production versus you know outreach Absolutely. and all the rest of it. Uh, Absolutely. And the timing. Um, yeah. I, yep. Yeah. And the timing, because I understand that it's six million dollars overall. It's all encumbered, so from a prior year. But it sounds like some of it has to be spent by the end of this fiscal year. But other, there's still additional funding for the production and other efforts that could go on Correct. And further. So, and it's all out of the $6 million? No, no. So, oh, okay. So the, there was an $8 million procurement in 21, 22, 20, one of the first years when I was like the only, only uh, employee and we had a lot of cost savings and we didn't have a public affairs team. And so we encumbered those funds. Right. And you're you're and that's that original, I think it was an eight million dollar, seven or eight million dollar contract that Mr. Um Lay and Mr. Thompson oversaw. We still have funds remaining in that uh I think we have about six million remaining of those funds. And those need to get spent by the end of this fiscal year. And it's going to be part of our um, kind of major push in conjunction with the privacy website. We're engaging in a really large public affairs effort to really now drive not only um, awareness of the agency and the privacy rights, but also drive additional engagement on our rulemaking and to drive additional engagement on just general complaints and enforcement. So that is going to be the media buy plan and a public affairs effort that will um, uh, basically be, be undertaken before the July 1st of this year. Um, we are looking at um, media channels that are more evergreen. So things like things that can extend slightly beyond that point. So uh, online video, uh, billboards, you know, some some sort of um, out of home presence. And that will be all as part of the presentation that Ms. White will present. That is separate but related to this $6 million encumbrance of this current year that was from the past fiscal year, in fact, the $6 million. That can take us three years on media production and other um, kind of stakeholder engagement and other aspects. And so those are the two pots that work together. So in tandem, um, over the course of the, the three years and on to say 2025, we will have about $14 million in public affairs uh, broken into these two pots. And we'd be happy to present on how we, we have spent and will spend those funds. Thank you. Yes, I think that would be very helpful. I had somehow yeah, yeah. inflated yeah. the eight and the six, and I only had eight in my mind instead totally. of 14. And yes, okay, that's very helpful. Thank you very much. Um, Sorry, Mr. Lay, did you have something on this yeah. exactly before we go to- yeah, on, on this point, yeah. Um, yeah, it was Mr. Thompson and I on the subcommittee there, and you know we've since dissolved that subcommittee. But yeah, we were tracking, you know, impressions, uh, you know, where which markets that they were going to. It was like, you know, mostly a radio buy in advance of um, the comment period. So yeah, I expect that we'll see that in um, future presentations on you know the yeah our public affairs work. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Mr. McTaggart. So, sorry, sorry. So it's just so I'm clear. So we have roughly twelve-ish million. Left. Six of it needs to get spent. Does it need to be actually spent by July thirty-first? And to be even more granular, you pay an agency to put ads up 
do the ads all have to be, you know, I guess finished by July 31st, or you could say, I'm going to pay you to run ads for the rest of 2020 calendar, 2024. Can you, that's that right. So those are the evergreen. So two, two questions. Yes, you're correct. Two, two pots, roughly 12 million left. Um, one pot for media buy needs to be spent and the media buy six, the 6 million pot has a tiny bit of production, uh, production um, budget in that pot as well that we will spend, but we also have the second 6 million pot, which is the production budget. So those, uh, the first pot, the media buy pot, which is primarily for media purchasing, will need to get basically paid out. It's encumbered, but we'll need to get paid out by July 1, uh, by, or June, uh, end of June, basically. Um, and so we will need to have paid those uh, invoices. But certainly if the vendor, and we're exploring options, supports evergreen options where we could buy, like say, you know, a billboard ad that stays on for six, six months, we are certainly looking at how to maximize our, our dollars. Uh, in that sense, so that it's not, you know, just a media blast just for the, you know, two two months. We're also certainly looking at what um, fit is right for our agency in terms of things like social media and uh, web ads and these types of things, balancing our privacy interests with reaching the community we want to reach in different, you know, different demographics across the state. So previously we did radio, which was pretty straightforward, um, but we are exploring other opportunities and we'll pre pre present that in the, um, in our spring meeting uh, with, with kind of the, the direction we're, we're undertaking. Um, and then lastly, um, certainly, I think there'll be ongoing past this fiscal year and future, both with media production, but also our own uh, agency, uh, a question of what, what and how much we wanna, we wanna do in this space. Um, some of the evergreen options I'm interested in personally are things like informative animations and illustrations that help consumers that don't understand these complex to topics understand how to invoke their rights, invoke opt-out preference signals, you know, what rights they have, et cetera. So that's kind of my goal is to use this to both raise awareness, drive engagement, but also have some like learning resources that then we can host on the privacy.ca.gov website or on, uh, you know, on various social media channels that we're comfortable with that help consumers understand uh, their rights. We um, Lastly, we just concluded as part of this budget, um, so a polling that we'll also present a, a bit of information on about what consumers know uh, about their rights, what they expect, what are their priorities in terms of you know, what things they care about with respect to privacy and what pieces of data they're most concerned about. We'll provide some insights about that. We're also using that to track KPIs over time where we will, and then this is gonna feed into the strategic plan, but no, how effective were our public effect, uh, public awareness efforts in 2024 and, or the and five, right? So we can see if people understand that they have these rights. Currently, not a lot of people do understand that they have protections or they misunderstand that they have protections that they don't. They think like companies, you know, need to ask consent when in fact they don't. So. Thank you, Mr. So, so Go ahead. So, so uh, just on this topic, Madam Chair, I'd, I'd love it if we could ensure that maybe at the March meeting, we, we have already the yeah. public affairs annual report in the March meeting, yeah. and I think I've gathered quite a bit of information about some of the detail that people would like yeah. to see. It's super, meet. super exciting for the you know, yeah. to have this kind of opportunity to spend that kind of money to get the word out. I because agree. As you say, the average California has no idea that there is a privacy law, and so yep. it's really uh, exciting. I'd love to, you know, have all all of our eyes on that in in, in March. Uh, and then my last question uh, for Vaughn is just, I, I find this. This may be how the state has to have it done. And the number, the 2024-25 budget is the, the 11.9 is it tracks with all the inflation, all the rest of it. But what's the difference between the cost of living and the baseline budget? Because when you look at the statute, it just says cost of living. Uh, and so why did they break it down, these two? Right. So the, the cost of living adjustment line that you see for us is the one tied to the CPI, which is specific only to CPPA. We're the only ones receiving that. Well, and then the baseline adjustments all the other state agencies are also receiving that, which are the employee compensation adjustments. So the, the first one is tied to our appropriation, and then we're receiving the CPI, Consumer Price Index Adjustment, to increase our appropriation. And then in addition to that, we are receiving the baseline adjustments, which is the employee compensation, which is just for um, employee benefits. I don't know if, if you want to speak can more on that. Good morning. Uh, just to twist it a little bit. So our statute does authorize a COLA adjustment. And as um, 
the presentation laid out, it is 3.6%. And so what that equates to is 440,000. But in conversations with the Department of Finance, because we have civil servant employees that do receive employee compensation and retirement adjustments, and it's handled through a separate budgetary process, they build those in and that's that 263. Yeah. And then we have that 177 that um, to get to the four total 440 total, which is our COLA, that we have to go through the budget change proposal process that we did submit. And so with that $177,000, we plan to fund one graduate uh, legal assistant position. So technically our COLA, is, again, is 440,000 broken up into those two buckets, just given how the Department of Finance builds our budget that we work with them on and collaborate. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. And also, I'm hope Mr. Laird will shut me down if I can't, if this is too far outside, but I would like to introduce Ms. Tiffany Garcia um, to the board um, and to the public. She's our deputy executive director, and we're very pleased to welcome her um, from the Department of Consumer Affairs, where, well, and the business, oh gosh, I'm not going to get it all, yes. BCSH yeah. agency, um, uh, where she has been a star for many years, so we're very glad to have been able to tempt her over here. Welcome. Um, other questions about the budget? I would like this for my own benefit, but I I dare to expect maybe for others. Um, Ms. Chidambira, if you could just give us, or whoever is the appropriate person, just give us a quick um, timeline summary of where we are in the budget process, um, what um, whether our uh, budget change proposal and everything has at this point been approved at what level and sort of where it goes from here, just so we have a sense of, of the status of our, of our funding. Sure, so the full BCP was submitted in the fall and it was um, included in the governor's budget on January, sec um, January 10. So that, that was the caller and the graduate legal assistant. We are expecting to submit another BCP in the spring. So that would be due in February and that will include positions for SB 362. So that'll be for the May revise. Thank you. And then the legislature considers all of it and yes. makes its decision in the sort of May, June, July timeframe. That's correct. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, other questions or comments from the board? Um, Mr. Sado, are there any public, is there any public comment? Yes, Edwin and Glenda, I'm going to unmute you and then you will have three minutes to make your comment whenever you're ready. Thank you very much. Again, this is Edwin Lombard. And on the topic of uh, outreach and the and the media budget, um, normally with government entities, the majority of the money is spent with mainstream media. I would simply suggest that a significant portion of this outreach budget be spent with ethnic media, because in the Black community specifically, uh, the majority of the information that we receive of this type that will reach the entities that you're trying to reach is done through ethnic media where on mainstream media we kind of gloss over these things and we're looking for the big ticket items uh to read but in ethnic media when something like this is put in into the uh, into the fray we pay close attention to it and we actually receive the information so i would just simply suggest or recommend spending with the uh, uh ethnic media uh, some of this budget uh, in the Black community, I would suggest the California uh, Black Media Association as an entity that you can go to. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lombard. Again, this is for agenda item three, budget update and priorities for spring 2024. If you'd like to make a comment at this time, please go ahead and raise your hand. Again, this is for agenda item three, budget update and priorities for spring 2024. Madam Chair, I'm not seeing any additional hands. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sabo, and um, to Mr. Lombard for the comment and to the board for the good questions, and especially uh, Deputy Director Chidambira for putting this together for us and informing us um, so effectively. Thank you very much. You. With that, we will move to agenda item number four, which is a strategic plan review and next steps from Sorello Solutions. Um, uh, if you recall, um, we last saw a presentation from the folks at Cervello Solutions in September, which was a high level interim report on the strategic plan process. Um, and I believe they have um, 
a draft um, plan ready for us to discuss today. Please turn to um, the materials for this agenda item in your packet, which consists of a presentation and um, a one page um, or two page strategic plan. Um, I did wanna ask before we get started, Mr. Ritz, did you have an opportunity to weigh in on this process? No, not be, for lack of their effort. I just felt like it was hard for me to opine on a strategic plan for something that You're I just new. started. Okay, perfect. So right. I think the timing now is great. I. You know, I, and I, but they definitely made efforts. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So this is, this is on me, not on you. Well, I, I think, and you, you're, it's a very logical and reasonable point that you might want to have a little bit more experience with the agency as well. So I just wanted to check though, before, no, no, I before we moved into it um, with that, welcome back. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, as I asked Ms. student bear, if you wouldn't mind letting us know when you advance the slide so we can flip our papers and I can look at my screen. Sure. Thank you. Will do. Oh, good morning, board members. Uh, my name is Eileen Jacobowitz with Sorella Solutions. My colleague, Jeanique Benoit, is here. And I realize that I should have brought my step stool and my gloves to this meeting, but I'll, I'll proceed. I have to say that podium is for a giant. It's yeah. exceptionally tall. And, and wide, uh, and wide. <laughs> I think yes. it makes... It makes everyone look small. Yes. Yeah, I, I was thinking maybe I could get on someone's shoulders and do this presentation, but I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, so thanks for inviting us back. And I, I want to say that in addition to all of the amazing work that the agency has completed that the executive director highlighted, they also reached a really important milestone, and that is the completion of their first strategic plan. And we're back today to talk a little bit about the process to share with you the draft strategic plan and to get your feedback on it. So if you go to the next slide, please. So hopefully you're familiar with our approach or you will remember our approach. Um, we started in May with a discovery process and here we are in phase three, where we're gonna share with you the uh, preliminary strategic plan. And I'll talk about each of the phases in a little more detail uh, as we go forward. So why don't we go to the next slide? So phase one that we started in May, as you recall, we spent the first bit of time just gathering information, understanding the current environment. So we spoke to most of you individually. Uh, uh, we gathered information from you ab about the landscape, your priorities, et cetera. We also conducted individual interviews with e each of the executive staff. And then we also uh, administered a survey to line staff, to uh, agency staff. And we took all that information and we analyzed it and we summarized the feedback. Next slide. Next, we took that information um, and we shared the findings with the executive team. We worked closely with them to identify goals and objectives. And we also crafted or uh, identified core values that were based on both staff survey feedback and also the executive team. So that completed phase two, and now we're here. Next slide. Oh, uh, well, just a reminder of what we asked about. We asked you and we asked the team about. Um, we asked for feedback on the mission statement. We asked for feedback on the current culture, on agency strengths, opportunities for improvement, what you see is what's ahead for the organization and then the landscape, and then top priorities for the next three years. Next slide. Uh, here's the mission. We asked for feedback on the mission. People said, this is pretty much what we do and why we exist. Next slide. And as you'll recall, when we shared in September, um, we shared that the feedback from both the executive team and staff was really positive about the agency. So they, talk, they talked about the strengths being both, you know, the caliber and the commitment of team. There's, you have an extraordinary staff here and people see it and recognize it and value it, all the skills that you have. Um, agency of nimbleness, because you're a new agency, you're not mired in your bureaucracy of being a, a legacy agency. Uh, the authorities that you have within the statute, people see that you can do a lot of important things. You have a lot of political support and open lines of communication, both with your sibling organizations or like organizations and also internally. Next slide. And then folks, of course, pointed to opportunities for improvement. Uh, one area was uh, roles and responsibilities. As a new organization, I think there people said, we need to be clear about what, what our lanes are, both at the board level, with the executive director, et cetera. 
uh, and people pointed to a need for additional staff and you heard that a lot of work has already been done to hire and fill vacancies. And one of the, some of the things that came up had to do with bringing other functions in house so you don't have to outsource them. And you're seeing that they're working on analysis around that now. Um, maturing the organizational processes and procedures as a new organization, I think that it's what we heard was that there still was plenty of work in terms of clarifying uh, procedures, uh, processes, how you do, how people do their jobs and documenting those kind of things. Uh, improved communication, while it was solid, we also heard from some folks that there's opportunities for improvement there. Uh, as a startup kind of culture, we heard that people are working really hard and a lot, and some people pointed to the need to make sure that folks also have work-life balance. Um, there were some folks pointing to a need for um, building more relationships with external organizations and then establishing criteria for supporting legislative bills. So that's what we heard. Now, let's see, do we hear more? Next slide. Okay, we also heard about trends. So uh, we asked, what do people see um, things that are in on the horizon that are important for the agency to be addressing, mitigating, anticipating? And uh, you'll see there are four high level trends and know that there was a lot of alignment with everyone on, on the trends. In fact, there's a lot of alignment on most of these things across hearing from y'all, hearing from executive staff and hearing from staff. So trends on the horizon, um, changes at the federal level that could impact your authority, uh, increased awareness of privacy issues. We know that privacy is on people's minds, especially around children's privacy. The dynamic nature of just the field, both AI and other advances and reg regulations around that. And um, interest from the state legislature. We heard that that's a big deal. That might mean that there'll be more work or more opportunities for the agency. And then next slide, uh, top priorities for the next three years. This is where folks said it's important to focus and you'll see that this directly feeds into the strategic plan, uh, finalizing the regulations, successful enforcement, public awareness and guidance, and building organizational capacity. Next slide, please. So here we are today, and um, we, your, the executive team and staff worked real, spent a lot of time um, digesting this information and being very thoughtful in their deliberations and as they developed the preliminary strategic plan. So we developed something, we, we gathered, we put everything together, we developed a pretty strategic plan for them. We gathered feedback from the executive team and here we are today to gather your feedback and public feedback. So with that, what I'd like to do is direct you to this document you have here. This is um, the draft strategic plan. And uh, what I'd like to do is, um, is uh, have, I think where we make sense to spend the most time is around the goals and objectives. But I do want to share with you um, that, I think we, do we have the, the vision on the slide before that? Yeah, so the vision is new. That's on, the, that's on one, one side of your uh, page there. The vision is, it was newly developed. The vision statement is, um, some, is the existing mission statement that you had before. And then if you scroll up there. Actually, so I, I, under, I understood you're, you're going to ask us to go through or to have comment, if we have comments if, on each piece. Sure, yeah, we'll go through. Well, let's go through, I'll go through the vision, mission, and values, and then we'll go back. Is that reasonable? Sure. Okay. Um, well, let's do it now. If you have comments about the vision or mission, let's do that now, sure. I have a very picky comment on the mission statement. Um, businesses and consumers are well informed about their rights and obligations. The order of businesses and consumers and rights and obligations is not in agreement. Um, generally speaking, businesses have obligations and consumers have rights. And so if we could swap obligations and rights, um, that would be, um, that would add clarity. I told you it was nitpicky. <laughs> uh, duly noted, we have Jeannie taking notes right here. Thanks for that. Sure. I also have a small comment. If you could, uh, Can you turn on your mic? It's on. Okay. 
If we could avoid using the term business and refer to the regulated community, just because business is a defined term in our statute and it could be read to exclude potentially some of the organizations that could be indirectly perhaps regulated by us, um, if it fits in the in the drafting, I think it will be better to avoid that confusion. Regulated, uh, regulated community or some other term that's a little bit more that that's, that cannot be read as referring to the specific definition of business that we have in the statute, perhaps. Thank so you. I I hear that and I see the reason. I I'm not sure we don't want to stick with the statute, and if we don't stick with it for businesses or regulated community, then I think we probably need to consider consumers. Um, yes, Mr. McTaggart. You know, uh, well, I hear what <clears throat> Madam Delatorre is saying from a, she's right from a privacy expert's point of view. I just worry a little bit if the average consumer is reading this, they understand business, they're going to be like, what's a regulated community? So I think maybe for clarity, I don't, you know, I, I totally hear what you're saying and you're, and you're correct. And I, as you know, one of my dreams is that it's not just businesses that are regulated, the nonprofits follow and, you know, government agencies and all the rest, but <clears throat> I don't know. So I, I, I can see going both ways anyway. And I and I think part of Ms. De La Torre's point was probably that businesses is also a subset of businesses within California. Um, but I tend to agree that even though it connects with the statute in a way that I think Ms. De La Torre is right in some context could be confusing, this this simpler language may be overall easier for folks to digest. Um, I think and Mr. Lay I, and then Mr. Worth. And, and I'm not Lee. particularly, you know, Strong. They're strong on it. <laughs> just trying to offer feedback. Yes, yes. Yeah. Same, same thing. You know, one's more accurate, but one reads better. Uh, and I, I would prefer the one that reads better, uh, at least for the mission statement, which, you know, isn't, no one's referring to that as their their legal basis for a lot of different things. It's business design. I, I will say I like the way that this mission statement boils down and extracts all of the preambular language in our law, which is, I think, one of the things that is um, most beneficial and well done about our law is that it is very clear about our, our mission, frankly, and what it is that we are supposed to do. And so I, I kind of like echoing um, some of that. Um, Mr. Ward? Yeah, I think we're good. I just was going to point out that in the goals, we do have regulated community, uh, right? So it does come up there. <laughs> Fair enough. So I think at least the fact that it is, it is used, but maybe just not in the mission statement. Um, one more thing, and I'm not completely strong on it, but consumers is also limiting. Maybe we should say residents of California so that everybody understands because there's, you know, protections in the law for individuals who will not read themselves as included if we use the term consumers. Um, so just consider using um, Californians, for example. I, I like Californians. Okay. There's two votes for Californians. We'll capture that. Thank you. Other comments on the mission statement? Uh, the only only thought is businesses are Californians too, right? So Californian businesses. So it's a little bit, um, we could certainly think of another term that's not consumers, uh, citizens maybe or something. No, I will or, avoid citizens. Not residents. everybody's a citizen. Yeah, re right. Residents. residents could be, uh, and you know, yeah. definitely have the ability to play with whatever works best. Yeah, I, I'm trying to think. I think, I mean, my for my own part, I think, yes, as a fictitious legal matter, businesses are Californians as well. But as a generalized kind of common understanding matter, uh, I think Californians would be understood to be people. Um, I don't feel strongly about consumers in this context just because it's parallel with businesses um, uh, and, and reflects our statute. But um, I'm not sure, as in, in terms of process, what is our best way forward here? So we'll be capturing your feedback and then we'll bring it back to the executive team and okay. make some recommendations. I will say that we work with a lot of state agencies and departments and um, we can actually look at some of their mission statements to see what they're using in terms of Californians versus residents, et cetera. So we can make recommendations around that. Okay, so I understand that we have on the table um, consumers as a possibility. Ms. De La Torre pointed out that that is also limiting um, in its way and people may be engaging in um, various activities that they don't think of themselves as being consumers, but as being what the statute calls natural 
persons. Um, uh, and she suggested residents of California, possibly Californians, you heard some of the challenges with with, with Californians. So you have, to, if you have the information you need. Yeah, okay. very helpful, thank you. We capture that, okay. All right, if there are no other comments, I'll move to values. And as you know, organizational values are used, are about how people show up every day and treat each other and treat the people they interact with outside the organization, and they help guide decision-making. So these are the four values that were developed um, based on input from staff and um, blessed by the executive team, crafted and blessed blessed by the executive team. I'll give you a moment to take a look at those. I just um, wanted to point out that innovation also has a reference to Californians. So yeah, it's, you could kind of match that to True. I had a, a, a more kind of general question about the values. The mission statement is, is, is appropriate, a broad statement of our goal external to the agency, what the agency's purpose is. These values seem very internal to me. Um, and as a personal matter or as a personal opinion, I would generally like to include some values that relate to our external mission. So transparency, for example, uh, fairness seems to apply um, beyond the internal workings of the organization. But I recognize that this may be a bucket for the internal workings of the organization. Um, so I wanted to ask if that was the case and, and um, if it has more flexibility um, then it seems to me that we could have some, we could we could also incorporate values that are about how we interact as an agency with the regulated community, with um, Californians um, and generally. Yeah, our intent was this is, these are external and internal facing, right? So, um, so it might be possible to do something to just make that a little bit more clear. So for example, under communication, it says we foster an environment of honesty and openness that the, it just felt like the internal environment to me, but you know, of course it doesn't say that literally, we communicate with purpose and clarity. That second part could be extended a little sure. bit to say we communicate with purpose and clarity both internally and with the public or something, something like that. So, so here so to try to add some language that's yeah feels external as well, right? Yeah, I, I would second that. I, you know, reading it, I, I could see that I think it was written to to apply both ways. Maybe changing the order of things and or just adding a little bit more context. But yeah, it does read at least for some of these, um, yeah, internal. Okay, thank you for that. Shall I move on? I think so. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you turn over your um, this single sheet, we're now on the uh, the goals, and you'll see that there are four goals. The first one is uh, strengthen public education, outreach, and engagement. And I'll just give you a moment to take a look at the goal and the objectives, and if let us know if there's any sub substantial, significant feedback you have on those. So again, I don't feel strongly about this, but on five, when we say educate the privacy community about the agency's efforts, 
I think our education um, objective goes beyond the privacy community. So maybe if we could use a term that's more inclusive than um, the privacy community. And um, just to point out, you know, we see again here consumer business and then a reference to California's privacy rights. So if we could find consistency on the terminology that mm -hmm. I think will be um, also, so that people don't think, oh, is this the same or is it different? Right. So if we change it in one place, change it in another place. Right. Like if we choose Californians, or maybe there's a better term just across across the um, document, just with the, the same terms. Same thing with business. If we end up in deciding that business is the right term, maybe use it across the board for um, all references or regulated community, or maybe there's a better term that we you know, cannot come up with, mm -hmm. but your team with um, the support of the agency might, might identify. Thank you for that. Next goal. Looks like it. Okay. Uh, second goal, vigorous, vigorously enforce privacy laws. I'll give you a moment there. I will say I'm not terribly bothered by <clears throat> a difference in the mission statement and this goal saying regulated community because um, it is so directed it's at very the specific, people right? who would who would understand that term. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't have any comment other than maybe we should have started with saying that this is a really good effort. <laughs> we just gave him the just trying to be thoughtful, but I, I just in general think it, it's very well put together. The executive team worked very hard, um, spent a lot of time, and had very thoughtful deliberation to create something that is an amazing roadmap for the next few years. It, it shows. But then I'm going to move us to the third goal, strengthen Californians' privacy rights. We had recommended Idahoans, but they rejected that out of hand. <laughs> I have a question on two. I'm not completely sure if you could elaborate on what that means, the standardized coordination, monitoring, and assessment of state and national legislation engagement and implementation to ensure compliance with the statutory requirements. Is it who's complying with the requirements, like the state agencies? I'm a little, what does that convey? I want to defer to staff on that. Just, I don't want to misspeak here. So this is number two on the third goal. Uh, certainly that can be um, more clearly worded, but this is to reflect our um, kind of harmonization mission. Uh, oh, okay. Maybe, yeah. maybe harmonization is a word that we might want to um, Maybe to promote harmonization. I read it as Ms. De La Torre did. I thought this was about the statutory requirements that apply to us. I, I read it as harmonization, but I, yeah, I think we could probably. Make I think if you just said to promote harmonization instead of to ensure compliance with statutory requirements, yeah, that would probably. We have that in four, the harmonization, but we can, we can words from it a bit. Okay. So, but the harmonization is on four, right? Right. Oh, of course. Is number two not that, is that not about tracking state and national legislation around the issues that you care about? Yeah, I think it's it's not it's um, partially 
processes, but partially the um, kind of Ms. Mahoney's portfolio. And um, we can certainly look at combining two to four to be more kind of concise. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you know, as you know, under our uh, direction on uh, in the statute, we regularly engage with the legislature, both here and elsewhere, as they look to implement um, these protections. And we want to promote um, uh, kind of we track those developments and then we um, try to promote harmonization. So. Yeah, and I also kind of read it as, you know, one of the goals was to have a standardized process for evaluating, you know, like what Marine's job is like, what do we support, what we don't. So I also kind of saw it as partially. So yeah, maybe, I don't know if you need a separate, yeah, I mean, yeah, we'll, how, how yeah. do you We'll try to capture both. Yeah. Just make it a little bit more intuitive from the perspective of somebody who didn't um, hear all of the conversations that I'm sure were into, went into developing. All right, move on to, all right, the uh, fourth goal, operational excellence. I'll give you a moment to take a look at that and the associated objectives. I do not feel strongly about this. And I almost hesitate to say it because it sounds very corporate and I don't intend it that way. And I do not mean to also characterize what Mr. Lay said in maybe the September meeting um, that way either, but I remember, I believe Mr. Lay saying something about um, having a goal of the agency growing with a positive culture, which is in here and not developing, and this was not his word, the sort of craft that a large organization can develop so that they become sclerotic and bureaucrat, overly bureaucratic. And I wonder if there is room to have this idea of remaining nimble. This is where I start to sound very corporate. Let's be nimble. Let's pivot. <laughs> agile. Don't forget agile. Agile. Don't forget agile, agile. That's the word I'm looking for. But I do think, you know, those are, of course, important, important things for organizations to be able to accomplish, whether or not there's some fashionable word about for it at the moment. And I think it would be um, a good um, portion of this goal for us to have, because we do have the opportunity as such a new organization to develop processes that allow us to perhaps not become too sclerotic. S sustain the agility that you have. Yes. Now. Sure. Thank you. Yes. I, you know, I, I was fine with your uh, <laughs> organization. I, I agree with that point. And um, I have no issue about the operational excellence. I would, maybe after we talk about this, like to go back to number one, the first goal that Okay, are we ready to go back? All right, can we flip back to goal number one, Mr. Lay? Yeah, so, you know, one thing, you know, number four on goal one is facilitate compliance through supplemental business guidance. And, you know, one thing that I raised during the call is I don't want to just uh, facilitate compliance. I don't, you know, I think the agency would do well to simplify, mm -hmm. right? And we see that in, you know, other jurisdictions, you know, the Canil has put out a lot of tools to make it easy to do a risk assessment. Um, so if we can capture simplifying compliance for businesses, you know, to Mr. Lombard's point is, is raised a lot, um, you know, want to make it easy for small businesses as well as large ones to, to comply to the extent they actually are covered, um, you know, $25 million, I'm going to argue if that's a small business, um, but yeah, make it easy for them, but also for consumers. Um, and I think we are doing a great job with consumers, you know, making it easy to, you know, opt out and, and things like that, global privacy controls. But um, yeah, just to see it reflected in these goals. I, I recall that the there was a lot of conversation for number four on what that verb should be, okay. facilitate, and you're suggesting Simple, simplify. simplify. So we'll take that back. Facilitate, yeah, I don't want facilitate to... and simplify. Okay. I, you know, 
Right. I saw almost here right size or something. <laughs> is that corporate? Agile, is that corporate? Is awesome. Let's make sure we agilely right yeah. size. Symbol, symbolize the, uh, well, this guidance. I guess I really wanted to speak in support of what uh, Mr. Lee mentioned. We have potentially a broad number of small businesses, medium businesses. So simplify and, and thinking about them, it's, I think, very important. Um, I just wanted to go back to your comment and, and you, you mentioned simplified compliance and through supplemental, we talk about guidance here, but some of the things that you refer to like the Knilar tools is yes. not just guidance. So may, perhaps it's both you know, guidance and potentially um, building tools for them to make compliance simple. And you know, I know that the we don't, I, I personally don't mean to kind of edit this on the spot. So feel free to take our comments back and, you know, work through what's the best way to express those. It might be that tools are built by the agency. It might be that the agency supports tools that are being built by others. I think that's, you know, very clear the case in some of the areas where the agencies um, placing a lot of attention, like the tools for opt-out, which are in part, you know, developed externally. So I don't want, I, I don't mean to force the agency right. to make a commitment to put resources towards um, tools, but perhaps make a reference to tools that, that make sense just beyond, beyond guidance. Thank you. I agree with that. I, we of course always have to be aware that in California under the California Administrative Procedures Act, we don't have as much flexibility as a lot of other jurisdictions do to create these things. Um, and so I just want staff and everybody to be aware that we're aware of that. Um, and that this is a, a gen, you know, this is a, this is an aspiration. Also the executive director mentioned in his update additional resources for businesses on the website, which I, poked around on um, while you were talking. And I think some of these, I mean, they're very straightforward um, charts and PDFs that just translate some of the statutory language into simple language for people to be able to digest easily. And I, I think I think this is great um, and should be should be really helpful. Um, uh, so you know more more maybe more of that in this goal would be great um, is what I would say. All right. All right. I appreciate your feedback. I appreciate you fought the tendency that we all have to do some serious wordsmithing. So thank you for sharing your thoughts in such a thoughtful way. Um, I want to go to the next slide. So it's separate, a separate file there. The PowerPoint slide. We just want to talk about next steps. Couple slides ahead. The last slide. That's okay. So next steps, we will send we'll synthesize your feedback. We'll make recommendations to the executive team. Once it's blessed by the executive team, uh, it'll be published on the website and shared with staff. Um, and then the implementation happens. Uh, I wonder if we need to stop for public comment. We will, uh, yes. Okay. Um, I was waiting. I won't leave. Uh, okay. Um, so was that, is that- That's all we have, that's all we have, yeah. All right. Thank you very much, and thank you for all of the effort that has gone into this over the last months, and for everybody um, within the agency and, and the board um, for all their work on it as well. Um, if there aren't other comments from the board, then I would like to ask for public comment, Mr. Silva. Yes, we have one member of the public, Chris. At this time, I'm going to unmute you, and you will have three minutes to make your comment. So go ahead. Whenever you're ready, you've been unmuted. Chris, you have three minutes to make your comment. If you'd like to unmute yourself at this time, I've unmuted you. This is the last call, Chris. I see your hand raised. You've been unmuted if you'd like to speak.
Madam Chair, I don't see any other hands other than Chris. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Sabo. Um, and again, we can keep an eye out to see if Chris reappears, uh, perhaps under the item for general public comments. Um, with that, we will move to agenda item number five um, with a slight caveat that I will look at Ms. Mahoney. And um, I, my understanding just from reading the agenda is that this is probably a fairly short um, item. So why don't we go ahead and do it before lunch if you're ready. Um, so agenda item number five is an update on the agency legislative proposal to require browser vendors and other platforms and devices as, as defined by regulation to include a feature that allows um, California uh, users to exercise their privacy rights through opt-out preference signals. Um, I'm sure the board will Remember, because it was just a month ago, we discussed and approved this, um, and I believe Ms. Mahoney has a briefing for us. Thank you very much um, for briefing us today. Please go ahead. Thank you, Chairperson Urban, members of the board, uh, for this opportunity to provide a brief legislative update, specifically with respect to the legislative proposal that the agency advanced at the December board meeting. At that meeting, consistent with the process uh, approved in 2022 for taking positions on bills and adopting legislative proposals, the board voted to advance a legislative proposal to require browser vendors that include a feature um, that allows users to exercise their California privacy rights through opt-out preference signals. Uh, the board also asked for progress updates on the proposal. So since that meeting, staff have begun working on draft language, we've had initial consultations with legislative council, and we're having com conversations with potential authors, um, which have been incredibly positive. We've also undertaken additional legal analysis, um, as requested by board members, and are confident in our approach. Based on this initial work and our experience with SB 362, the California Delete Act, we're confident that we have adequate resources to effectively sponsor the bill. Additionally, we have new staff joining the legislative team later this month, which will further expand our resources. And thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Mahoney. Questions, comments? Uh, I missed one yeah. question that is short. Um, you mentioned that additional legal analysis. It's not nice. it's okay. Yeah. Okay. I believe that's all back up and <laughs> give the delegate for. No, just quickly, um, you mentioned additional legal analysis has been completed. Was that already shared with the board through a memo? I might have not read it, but perhaps it has been shared, or, or maybe there are plans to share it in the future. I'm going to refer to Mr. Lane. Uh, good, good morning again. Good afternoon, almost. Um, yes, uh, a memo has been. Uh, issued to the board, uh, although it was uh, earlier this week. So, thank you. I uh, apologize. It's um, listed, but I, I'll make sure to read. Thank you for all that. All right. Uh, there, if no other comments or questions from the board, Mr. Sapa, is there any public comment? This is for agenda item five: update on agency legislative proposal. If you'd like to speak on this item at this time under public comment, please go ahead and raise your hand using Zoom's raised hand feature or by pressing star six if you're joining by phone. Again, this is for agenda item five, update on agency legislative proposal. This is the last call for public comment on agenda item five. Madam Chair, I'm not seeing any hands. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabo. Thank you again, Ms. Mahoney. Um, and we'll look forward to additional updates as they arise. I suggest that we um, go ahead and break for lunch, um, in part because it might be warmer where we're going, and I could use a little time in a warmer room if that's amenable to everybody. Um, I would like to inform the public and the board that we will take out of item, uh, out of order from the agenda, item number eight during uh, the time that we're eating lunch, which will be the closed session item, pursuant to government code section one 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 two excuse me, 26E1 and 2A, the board will be meeting in closed session to confer and receive advice from legal counsel regarding the following matters, California Chamber of Commerce versus California Privacy Protection Agency et al. and California Privacy Protection Agency et al. versus the Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Sacramento, um, California Chamber of Commerce. In addition, during closed session, the board will be meeting pursuant to government code section 11126A1 to discuss the executive director's annual review. 
Um, I will say that we will, um, for purposes of the member, members of the public, we will not be back before 1 p.m., but we could arrive at any point after that. Um, but please feel free um, to step away um, as you would like. We will keep the public meeting open on Zoom and we'll return when we are when our session is complete. Yes, Mr. McTaggart. I don't know if it's uh, permissible, but I just think just for the ease of the public, yeah. if we took number seven now, we could essentially end the public portion and then you wouldn't have to wait around for us. To we still back. have to do um, both the uh, open item for public comment and the future agenda items, which is not terribly long, but it it but, does but, have some. But we could, I, I, unless anybody has lots of agenda items, we could maybe do that. And it would, it would... There are a few. But sure. I mean, it would just alleviate the public waiting around for us. Okay. Um, let's move to agenda item number six, public comment on items not on the agenda. Um, before we proceed with this item, please note that the only action the board can take is to listen to comments and consider whether it will, whether it will consider the topic at a future meeting. We cannot take any other action on the item at this meeting. Um, the, it may seem as though we're not being responsive, and um, that is not our intent. Um, following these guidelines is critical to ensure that the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act is followed and to avoid undermining either the commenter's goals or the board's mission. Um, but again, for this item, agenda item number six, the public is welcome um, to comment on any, top, any topic that is not on the agenda uh, for today. Mr. Sabo, do we have um, public comment? Yes. First, we have Justin Kay. Justin, I'm going to unmute you at this time, and you'll have three minutes to make your comment. This is for agenda item six, public comment on items not on the agenda. Hi, good afternoon. Um, so Wall Street AI is coming. Um, banks are spending the most on AI across industries. Uh, Consumer Watchdog recently issued a report which goes through patents filed by major investment banks. And basically every bank is going to have its own version of chat GPT giving financial advice. Uh, it's definitely concerning, um, but we're glad the privacy agency has draft language regarding generative AI and training data. Uh, we notice there are parts that are options for board discussion. Um, not totally clear on what that means for the finality of the language, but we hope these rules are passed so Californians um, can know more about these language models and uh, protect themselves accordingly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have Andrea C. Andrea, I'm gonna unmute you at this time. Okay, you have three minutes to make your comment. Again, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the board. My name is Andrea Cow, and I am the Director of Public Policy at the California Asian Pacific Chamber of Commerce, representing the interests of the over 746,000 Asian American and Pacific Islander owned small businesses throughout California. We're here today to reiterate our concerns with the CPPA's 2024 approach to regulations. Last month, we joined a coalition of small businesses and sent a letter to the CPPA raising our concerns about the CPPA's proposed artificial intelligence regulations related to automated decision-making technology. In our view, a CPPA unilateral regulatory approach without collaboration with the legislature will lead to multiple and conflicting laws in 2024, which could severely harm small businesses in California. In addition, it is crucial to expand engagement beyond formal meetings and comments and open up channels to collaborate with other key stakeholders. As the CPPA reviews the economic impact of its 2024 regulations, we request that the CPPA keep in mind part of Governor Gavin Newsom's small business proclamation, and I quote, California small businesses account for over 99% of total businesses in the state and employ more than 7 million people, nearly half of the state's private sector workforce. Our small businesses are global leaders in innovation and economic competitiveness and embody the entrepreneurial spirit that drives the economy of the golden state, end of quote. Also, as the CPPA develops its 2024 regulatory approach, please keep in mind California's $37.86 billion budget deficit. Small businesses help to contribute to California's state revenues 
and we need more of them to stay and thrive in California and not shut down or move to another state due to overregulation. In sum, we appreciate the opportunity to be heard, and we hope that the CPPA 2024 regulatory approach is balanced and allows our small businesses to continue to prosper in California. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Mr. Saba? Yes, next we have Julian C. Julian, I have unmuted you. Please go ahead whenever you're ready. You have three minutes. Thank you. Um, you can hear me okay this time? Yes, yes. Thank you okay, so much great. for coming back. No, no. Thank you for the opportunity. Doing Kennedy with the California Hispanic Chambers of Commerce. And good afternoon. The California Hispanic Chamber Chambers of Commerce is made up of over 125 Latino and diverse chambers representing the over 815,000 Hispanic-owned businesses uh, across the state. Now, I have a couple of items that, that I would like to highlight as we enter uh, 2024. Let me start with the race to regulate artificial intelligence. We expect that Governor Newsom, C CPPA, and the legislature is going to move on regulating AI. We expect the legislature will introduce 20 or more pieces of legislation on AI alone. So one of our primary questions for CPPA uh, is what is CPPA doing to coordinate with the legislature? Has CPP, as CPPA reached out to the legislature? If so, what has been the conversation like? If not, when will CPPA reach out? Let me paint a picture of, of what it looks like uh, from where small business uh, is standing. CPPA adopts regulation on opt-out uh, this April and expects compliance by October, 2024. The legislature passes a bill on opt-out conflicting with the CPPA in 2024, effective 2025. What happens then? We have a regulatory mess that is likely to eliminate small businesses from California's economy because they do not have the resources to comply with multiple and potentially conflicting regulations. The bottom line, CPPA cannot regulate AI in a vacuum as it is likely to harm California's economy, particularly small businesses. Our suggestions on AI regulations are simple collaborate with other branches of government and not operate in a silo, except that CPPA cannot address AI in one swing. So a phase in approach may be appropriate approach. Wait, evaluate and see if the regulation is working for consumers and businesses before adding more regulations. Constant amendment to regulations is unrealistic and can be catastrophic for our members. Again, thank you. And we look forward to being part of the development of CPPA regulations in 2024. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Mr. Saba? Next, we have PB Wen. I'm going to unmute you at this time, and you'll have three minutes to make your comment. Go ahead and begin whenever you're ready. Hi. Um, thank you for this opportunity. Um, representing my um, company here, um, and I know one thing that is, is it's a concern for us, it's going to be in terms of the privacy audit. So which um, is where my question is going to come from. I would love to know what, what the agency is planning in terms of um, um, privacy audit. Um, when is that going to kick in place? And um, what are the um, regulations in terms of, of budget and stuff like that? Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Saba? This is the last call for agenda item six, public comment on items not on the agenda. If you'd like to speak at this time, please go ahead and raise your hand using Zoom's raised hand feature or by pressing star nine if you're joining by phone. Michael McGee, I'm going to unmute you and you will have three minutes to make your comment. I've unmuted you, please go ahead whenever you're ready. Thanks, very briefly, just wanted to thank uh the board for taking these ahead of lunch. I know it's a small thing, but it makes a big difference for the public's access um, and being able to fit this into the day. So appreciate you guys taking this time. Oh, thank you, Mr. McGee. <laughs> we, we, we appreciate it. Are there any other public comments at this time? This is for agenda item six, public comments on items not on the agenda. Madam Chair, I'm not seeing any additional hands. Wonderful. Um, thank you very much to everyone who commented. Um, we will go ahead and move to agenda item number seven. This is the item I mentioned at the top of the meeting that is available for a discussion of future agenda items. At this time, first the board and then the public will have the opportunity to suggest agenda items for a future agenda. As a reminder, we can only discuss whether to place the items on a future agenda. 
um, under the Bagley Keen Open Meeting Act, similar to the previous agenda item, we cannot discuss any of the substance of these items because they have to be separately agendized and noticed, but we can do some planning for future meetings. Um, so let me first go through the running list of items I have gathered from our um, uh, recent previous discussions and our regularized agenda. Um, along uh, which will include some updates to that for 2024 from staff. Um, and then we can find out if the board has additional items and whether the public does as well. Um, so today we've covered our regularized meeting item for January, which is the governor's budget and our budget within an act. We know to expect um, regulation updates and requests for board feedback and votes um, on uh, the re regulatory package and packages that we've been discussing, as we discussed in our December meeting and previous. Our regularized agenda for our March meeting also includes our annual item on public affairs, um, which is the annual annual public awareness reports and priorities. And I know staff have heard we've um, we've been very interested in this topic as we always are as a board. And there are a few things that we would um, we would love to hear about um, in that meeting. So I'm sure um, you will work on that and we'll look forward to it. Um, I'll say a little bit more about the regularized calendar in a minute. Other items on my list are um, a report from the rulemaking process subcommittee, which is Ms. De La Torre and I. Um, we will be considering what we've learned from the rulemaking work we've done so far. Um, the board handbook, um, which we talked about in September, um, that will come back when um, with staff's recommendations on uh, both board feedback from the September meeting and any individual feedback that they have received. Um, the chief privacy auditor position um, will come before us when we can. Um, when CalHR allows. Um, and we have final stages of the strategic planning process, um, but we have, of course, had a really good discussion about that today. Um, uh, Mr. McTaggart has uh, requested consideration of rulemaking that would implement the right to delete to include partial deletion. Um, and that is, that is on the list, I believe, for um, when we're talking about regulations again. Oh, on the handbook um, discussion, I just wanted to be clear um, that for, because that's our governance handbook, um, I will make sure that's on the agenda for a meeting when we are all here. Um, you've all been very diligent in attending meetings, so it hasn't been an issue, but I just wanted to be sure um, to be clear about that. We will, um, as we learned earlier today, um, at some point here about the grant program, um, so the plans for that, updates and processes. Um, so thank you to Ms. De La Torre um, for asking about that. Um, now, let me say a little bit about the regularized items for 2024. Um, staff have recommended some minor movement and some items, so I just want to give everyone a heads up so we have a picture of the year. Um, so the regularized calendar um, for January is the January 10 budget and the BCP, um, and the direction for spring budget changes and priorities, which we talked about today. Um, for next year, staff is um, recommending that we add the executive director's review to January instead of we put it over to January, but instead of having it at the last meeting of the year, that would give us um, a whole year uh, worth of time to, to talk about it. And given everything else, they thought that was the better place for it. Um, regularized calendar for March, we have the annual public awareness report and priorities. That's no change there. We know we are going to hear about details on the executed and planned media expenditures, the six plus eight million dollars. Um, and of course, Mr. Lombard had a comment about some of the expenditures earlier. And so we'll look forward to hearing about all of that. Um, staff would also um, is planning to move the annual enforcement report and priorities item up to March from July to allow for board input earlier in the year. Um, I, I'm pretty excited about this, um, given we have obviously, again, a lot of interest on the board about enforcement. Um, so we'll look forward to hearing about that. I mean, I think that responds to a request for a bit more discussion about enforcement priorities that have come up. The regularized calendar for May is our bi first our biannual regulations proposals and priorities. Um, uh, most of you will recall our conversation last May. It's coming around again and will include um, items that we've brought up and staff have brought up over the year. Um, the change here is to move the updates and initial board positions on pending legislation up to May from July. 
Um, as you know, given the California legislative cycle, there's not really a perfect timing for this. Um, they're very active, sort of from April all the way through July. Um, Ms. Mahoney recommends, though, that we start in May. That will allow us to take some positions earlier in the cycle. The good news is it simplifies our July calendar a little bit. But everybody, of course, should be aware <laughs> that we may still need to talk about ledge stuff in July because it can come back up again or new things can come up. It's a very dynamic cycle. Um, so, but that would, um, so in that case, the regularized calendar for July includes um, the, the item that we had last year and will continue to include, which is the um, budget plan to the board for the upcoming BCP process. So that's the second of our, our planned budget discussions each year. This is the same um, as last year. And then the change here is since we have shifted the legislative um, conversation will shift the annual hiring update, including diversity and inclusion metrics up from September. Now, the regularized calendar for September in the past has included the hiring update and the ED's delegation renewal. We handled the ED's delegation renewal um, in a more sort of long-term fashion, of course, and I wanna remind the board, we can always revisit the delegation at any time. You just need to uh, mention it um, during a uh, request for future agenda items. Um, but since we don't need to do that this year and we can move the hiring update, that means we do not necessarily have to have a regularized meeting in September. I would ask that you please do continue to hold the date in case we need it for regulations, for example, um, but we may be able not to have a meeting in September. And then for November, we have our second legislation um, discussion, which we had um, in December of this year, and the second regulations discussion. Okay, so I apologize that took a little bit of time. I just wanted to walk through it because a couple of things um, moved around um, so that we have a picture of the year um, before I request um, additional items, et cetera, um, from other board members. Um, I don't have an item, but I do have a small personal announcement. Can I make it when we come back or should they make it now? Um, Mr. Laird, I, th I think... I think, can she make a personal announcement? Uh, yes, of course, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, my announcement is that I plan on stepping down from the board this year. Um, the Senate has started a process to select a new um, board member. And it's just due to um, personal circumstances and the need for attention as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. De La Troy. Do you have a sense, will we have the benefit of your expertise for another meeting or two? It's okay if you don't know, I. The goal will be to avoid an overlap where there is no board member representing the Senate, but I, mm -hmm. other than that, I, I, I cannot give you further detail. Um, we will see how long it takes for a new appointee to be selected. Okay, thank you, Ms. De La Troy. Um, and I hope that we have this opportunity um, in a future board meeting, but I, I, we really value your expertise, your contributions, your dedication, and we'll be very sorry to see you go, um, although very grateful for your service. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, any other future agendas? Yes, Mr. Lay. Yeah, uh, I wanted to echo what you said about uh, working with Ms. De La Torre. It was, it's been a pleasure and, you know, um, yeah, I'm definitely gonna miss your expertise. Uh, and, and and I guess the, I'm sorry to shift, um, you know, I, I guess, did we mention the grant program in the list? Yes. Okay, okay. I just wanted to. It was a kind of a long list, <laughs> so, but it is in there. Okay. Yes. Mr. McTaggart. Sure, thanks. Well, I just wanted to say um, to Ms. Delatore uh, how important she was to the entire process of the initiative. I think I said it before, but uh, she was one of the privacy experts who first kind of gave me the time of day and was willing to help out along the way. Always gracious. Uh, true expert in her field, um, especially with uh, really important for us was someone who's expert in GDPR because that was our North Star to, to, to such an extent. Um, and I just want to say thank you. I only got to serve with you for a short amount of time here, but I know how much work you did. Since all of you original board members did way more work than we are doing now uh, originally. And I just want to say thank you for your commitment to privacy. Uh, the state has been lucky to have you and uh, it's been a real honor uh, working with you professionally. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. I, I would like to point out that our initial regulatory package 
which sounds minor because I said initial, but which is massive. Um, Ms. De La Torre and I were the regulations subcommittee, and it is more than fair to say that her organization of how we thought about um, separating out the topics for that package and pursuing it um, was key to our ability to do such a an ambitious and important thing with just ourselves um, and very little expert staff to begin with. Um, so um, just on a personal note, it was a joy to work with you on on that and um, and uh, and to benefit from your expertise. All right, are there any agenda items from the uh, public? This is for agenda item seven, future agenda items. If you'd like to make a comment on this agenda item, please go ahead and raise your hand using Zoom's raised hand feature. Again, this is for agenda item seven, future agenda items. Last call for future agenda items from the public. Go ahead and raise your hand if you'd like to speak at this time. Madam Chair, I'm not seeing any hands. Thank you, Mr. Sabo. Um, thanks to all the members of the public um, for their time so far today. We will now go into actually in order, closed session, um, pursuant to government code section 1126E1 and then 2A, the board will meet in closed session to confer and receive advice from legal counsel regarding two matters, California Chamber of Commerce versus California Privacy Protection Agency et al. and California Privacy Protection Agency et al. versus the Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Sacramento, California Chamber of Commerce, and um, secondly, um, pursuant to government code section 11126A1 to discuss the executive director's annual review, um, we will not return before 1.15. Um, uh, well, actually, we will not return before 1 p.m. As I said earlier, we could return anytime after that, but we will, and we will keep the public meeting open, but we will be returning um, just to adjourn the meeting. So thank you to everyone who doesn't stick around um, for your participation in our um, process and in our meeting um, today. And thanks to the board members, and we will retire to closed session. Thank you. Um, welcome back, everyone, um, from the closed session. Our final agenda, we'll move to our final agenda item, number nine, which is adjournment. I'd like to thank everyone, the board members, staff, especially those of you who've trekked here from other places, um, and members of the public for all of your contributions to the meeting today and to the board's work overall. May I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? I'll so move. Thank you, Mr. Lay. May I have a second? I second. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. I have a motion and a second to adjourn the meeting. Mr. Sabo, would you please conduct the roll call vote? Yes. Aye. 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 Thank you very much. The motion has been approved by a vote of four to nothing. This meeting of the California Privacy Protection uh, agency board is uh, hereby stands adjourned. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>